this time I will present our a little bio on our guest speaker Colonel Alex McClinchy US Marine Corps Colonel McClinchy enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in November 1964 shortly after graduating from Bucknell University he completed boot camp at Paris Island South Carolina and infantry training at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and received orders to the 3rd Marine Division in Vietnam, Republic of Vietnam, as an infantry rifleman. His orders were terminated upon his selection to Officers Candidate School, Quantico, Virginia. He was commissioned as second lieutenant in December 1965. Lieutenant McClinchy then attended Officers Basic School and upon graduation was selected to the infantry officer, selected as an infantry officer. He reported to the 1st Marine Division, Republic of Vietnam, in July 1966 and was assigned to Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, as a rifle platoon commander. He was promoted to 1st Lieutenant in April 1967 and completed his combat tour in August 1967. Upon returning to the States, he was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina and promoted to captain in October 1967. He served as company commander and later became the Battalion Operations Officer S3 until his release from active duty in December 1968. Captain McClinchy joined the Marine Corps Reserves in February 1969 and served continuously in various command and staff builds until his retirement in July 1996. In 1973, while serving as commanding officer of Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 25th Marines, the company was selected as the outstanding ground company in the Marine Corps Reserves. During these years of service, he was fortunate to have numerous periods of extended active duty. The most significant bill was that tactics instructor at the Command and Staff College in Quantico, Virginia. Colonel McClinchy was promoted to Major in July 1975, Lieutenant Colonel in 1982, and Colonel in July 1988. His personal awards include Purple Heart with Gold Star, Second Award, the Meritorious Service Medal, the Combat Action Ribbon, along with numerous unit service and campaign awards. He is a graduate of the Amphibious Warfare College and the Command and, St and Staff College, along with numerous courses at the Landing Force Training Command. He and his wife, Molly, reside in Southern Butler County in Adams Township. He has three adult children, two adult stepchildren, and many grandchildren. I now present Colonel McClinchy. Good evening. First of all, I have to set the record straight. I am not by any means a public speaker. And I don't do prepared speeches. So the reason I'm here is because I could not ignore a request from Sergeant Major Sam Zerzola and followed up by Jerry Puff. It just was not possible to ignore or decline their invitation. You heard my bio. It's better than it, it reads better than it probably is. But I was fortunate to have served in Vietnam early on in the war, from July of 66 to August of 67. We Marines at that time were highly motivated, and the war had not become unpopular in this country. All Marine second lieutenants, particularly the infantry officers and the artillery officers, were chomping at the bit to get to Vietnam. We actually had fights in the, in the passageways at basic school for guys wanting to be infantry officers, believe it or not. 
at the time that I was there, I had a very limited perspective on the war. I did not know the big picture by any means. All, the only thing that I knew was what my platoon or my company, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, were doing. As most of you all know, South Vietnam was divided into four corps, four core areas, and they were Roman numerals, one, two, three, and four. I Corps, which was from Quang Nai north to the DMZ, at the time I was there, was the Marines' responsibility. Later, the Army joined us. Two Corps, which was the Central Highlands, three Corps in the area around Saigon, and four Corps down in the Mekong Delta. That's how the com com country was divided. Now, since departing Vietnam 55-0 years ago, my memory is not that great. However, from 2006 to 2014, I've been fortunate enough to have made nine trips back to Vietnam as a tour leader. And 90% of the people who go on these tours are Vietnam veterans, their families, or they may be college students. For example, a group from the Citadel, uh, a group from VMI went on these tours. One of the more interesting tours I had was the Naval Academy class of 1966. And uh, that was a that was a pretty uh, impressive class. One of the class members was Lieutenant Colonel Ollie North. Uh, there were a number of flag officers in that class also. But given these nine trips back to Vietnam, I've learned a great deal about the country, the war, and the people. I'll get into that toward toward the end which will be fairly soon. <laughs> My first eight months was in a combat base south of Chulai on the east side of the Song Trabong River. And our company's sector of responsibility ran east out to the Nui Nam Tam Peninsula. Most of our activity was reinforced squad and platoon patrols. And the opposition was local VC elements and some main VC, main force VC units, not hardcore NVA. Our company ran about 20 patrols a day, and these patrols were either reinforced squad patrol, ambushes, uh, listening posts. All this was meant to pacify for lack of a better term, uh, our area of responsibility. We also had battalion and multi-battalion operations. And we were located just north of the Operation Starlight area. Most of you Marines have all heard of Operation Starlight, which was the first major Marine operation of the Vietnam War. And that was in August of 1965. My last five months were spent in a combat base about 15 miles southwest of Da Nang, just below Hill 55. And our sector of responsibility was called Dodge City. And the main reason for that was because of the heavy NVA concentration and the large number of mines and booby traps, particularly bouncing beddies. Uh, I'm not going to describe Bounce and Betty's. Most of you know what they are. We patrolled this area very heavily, but the VC and the NBA decided when and where they wanted to engage. We also participated in a large number of multi-battalion and multi-nation, meaning Arvin, Vietnamese Marines, and Korean Marines joining us on operations such as Arizona and Operation Union 2. We took a lot of casualties. 
Uh, and I took more than my share in my platoon, particularly legs. Because of mines and booby traps, I lost 20 legs in my platoon. Some Marines were multiple legs. The, uh, a Marine rifle platoon at full strength is 42 men. Sometimes my platoon was 20 or 22. In the last two months, I had five KIAs, and I carried this list with me at all times as a reminder, listing these five Marines. And every time I visit the wall, including yesterday, I go over there to their panel and row number and reach out to each of them. Now, since my tour ended in 1967, as I mentioned, there's some big events that I was not fortunate enough to participate. The first of this event was Caisson, which started on 21 January 68 and was a 77 day siege. The 26th Marine Regiment was up against three NVA divisions. Put that into perspective. In the Marine Corps, three infantry regiments and an artillery regiment make up a division. Our divisions are a little larger than communist divisions, but still, it was a regiment against three divisions. And the NVA thought they were going to do well there because they looked back to 1953 to Jim Ben Phu. I've had the privilege of going to Dem Ben Phu on one of my tours. And Quezon was almost a carbon copy as far as geography to Dem Ben Phu. Completely surrounded by high mountains and hills with a combat base down in the, in the valley. But it didn't work out that way. Uh, the Marines defended, they took, they took tremendous casualties, but they defended and they held Quezon. That was the focus of the American command. General Westmoreland and Max V down there in Saigon, they thought that the NVA, that their primary objective was Quezon. Turned out that wasn't their primary objective. The Tet Offensive started like 10 days later on 31 January, and you heard the number of casualties that occurred on 31 January. 31 January, the Tet Offensive started, and the NBA <laughs> assaulted throughout all of South Vietnam, but the biggest concentration was in the city of Hue. There were 10,000 NBA troops, and I don't know how many thousand VC, but eventually, after bitter street fighting, and you've all seen pictures, film, etc., the NVA were defeated. Now the interesting point here is that that was that was going on all of February of 1968 and into March. It really took the NVA four years to mount another big offensive, and that was the Easter Offensive of 1972. That started on March 30th. The NVA charged across the DMZ with infantry, tanks, and artillery. They also attacked through the Central Highlands, coming in from the Ho Chi Minh Trail to try to cut South Vietnam in half. Initially, the Arvin, the army of South Vietnam, fell back. But they still had U.S. advisors, and they still had U.S. air, artillery, naval gunfire, and logistics support. And the NVA were soundly defeated. At that time, there were no ground, no American ground combat units in I Corps. So it was it was up, up to the South Vietnamese. And eventually 
they prevail. But they had our total support as far as supporting arms. Now a little sidebar on this. When that attack started, the commanding general of the 1st Arvin Division jumped on a helicopter and took off. He just left. His advisor was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Turley. And effectively, Colonel Turley took over that division because they were just totally disorganized. And he rallied the Arvin. And the Arvin finally start, stopped their retreat or retrograde movement and went in the offensive and drove the NVA back across the DMZ. There was a Marine captain by the name of John Ripley who was down in Dong Ha, which is south from the DMZ, and there's a bridge across the river there on Highway 1. There was a column of 42 NVA T-62 tanks barreling down the highway. And Captain Ripley, unbelievably, from the south side of the river, hand over like this, went under the bridge, placing explosives under the bridge, and blew the bridge, even though he was ordered not to. He earned the Navy Cross. Most of us feel he should have had the Congressional Medal of Honor. And uh, Colonel Ripley uh, died about 18 months ago. After that final success that the Arvin had, the next three years later was the Spring Offensive of 1975. And there, the Arvin had no U.S. support of any kind. The Arvin were routed. The Vietnamese Marines, of which there were only two battalions, fought val valiantly, and when they ran out of ammo, they, they died in place. And we all know, and we've all seen pictures of 30 April 1975, when the NVA tanks crashed through the gate of the Presidential Palace in Saigon, and the war was over. Now, there's some interesting questions I, I have, and, and you probably have also. You know, we, at the end of the Korean War, which was 1953, we agreed to drawing a line at the 38th parallel and saying, okay, North Korea is up there, South Korea is down here, bad guys up there, good guys down here. In Vietnam, less than 12 years later, before we even started, we drew a line at the 17th parallel, creating a DMZ, saying bad guys up there, good guys down here. It didn't work either time, particularly, particularly when you look at Korea. Fifth, uh, what is it? Uh, 60, 64 years later, and we're, look at the situation we're in now. I have a little story that you'll find interesting. Uh, on one of my trips, I was in Play Coop, which is in Tukor, very near the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we stopped at the cemetery because there were some school kids that had just walked by, and we saw this cemetery, so we stopped. We went there, and the caretaker and his wife were at the cemetery. And the, I had my Vietnamese counterpart. I do not speak Vietnamese. As much as I've tried to learn, it's a very difficult language. But I had my Vietnamese counterpart there, and we were into a conversation. And the wife told the guy to go put your uniform on. So it turns out this guy was an NDA major. He had been a private at Dem Ben Phu. In the communist Vietnamese retirement system, you get your check, but you still have to work. So his job was as caretaker for this cemetery. 
Well, after we got into a little more conversation, turns out he was my adversary in Dodge City, some 75 miles away. He knew all, he didn't know me personally, but he knew all about Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. Uh, he and I aren't, aren't buddies on Facebook, I'll be honest. <laughs> but uh, it was very ironic that, that to just trip over or run into this guy. Since I'm on the subject of cemeteries, there's cemeteries throughout Vietnam. The sad part of it is once the NVA took over the country, they bulldozed all the urban cemeteries. Just bulldozed them all. And they have their own NVA and VC cemeteries. And I guarantee you there's over a hundred of them in South Vietnam. They also created monuments. And they created these monuments on pieces of what we called our key terrain. Example in Chulai, there's Hill 43, which, which is on the west side of the airfield. And that was a defensive position for us to protect the airfield. There's a big NVA monument on that hill. Hill 55, as I mentioned, where, where I was south of, southwest of Da Nang, there's another huge NVA monument. I will say this, though, going back there the number of times I have. The Vietnamese people, believe it or not, particularly down in the south, they, they like Americans. 75% uh, of the people in Vietnam today were not alive during the American War. It's a very young country. And Papa San and other relatives did not, did not make it. Uh, that, that's, there's, there aren't very many, there aren't very many people my age or older. Capitalism in the South is, I mean, it's free enterprise mom and pop operations, uh, not your typical communist country by any means. One last thing, there are a number of expat veterans, they number in the hundreds, that are living in Vietnam. Now, they either didn't come back or they came back and couldn't adjust or chose not to adjust and went back to Vietnam, and they live there now. And uh, since they're 70 plus at this point, it's, it's a dying breed. If you're interested in history or reading anything about Vietnam, I have two books that I would highly recommend. The first is Matterhorn, and it's written by a former Marine Lieutenant by the name of Carl Marlantis. Marlantis. And the second one is Way, 1968, by Mark Bowden. And it's about 540 pages of small print, but it is an outstanding book. I'm about two-thirds of the way through it right now. It's just recently published, and it's very good. I want to thank everyone. I think you have a wonderful ceremony here. I went to the, uh, uh, when the wall was here, the beginning of July, down in Hampton, and they had nothing compared to what you folks have up here. You, you are to be commended. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Polensky, for your outstanding insight. Thank you very much.